So it's a tremendous pleasure to uh, be speaking today to you about uh, uh, genetics uh, on the uh, cutting edge. Um, the title of this session is called News from the Genetics Front, and I'm going to give an introduction or primer um, and uh, leave most of the new findings to the investigators that fo follow me. So there are two types of genetic alterations in, in cancer. Uh, one is the hereditary changes. These are present in the germline and all tissues in the body. In other words, these kinds of genetic changes can be passed from parents to their offspring. Um, these mutations are almost always retained in the tumor tissues, and usually if the mutation involves a tumor suppressor gene, the second copy of that tumor suppressor gene can be uh, mutated as well or deleted. Uh, all genes come in pairs, so you, for tumor suppressor genes, you generally have to knock out both copies. There are exceptions to that. Uh, they're heritable in a Mendelian fashion, so the, the gene itself can be passed uh, to uh, offspring with a 50-50 uh, chance uh, of being passed to the uh, children of a person who is affected. Uh, the germline carriers have an elevated risk of certain kinds of cancers, and the kind of cancer will depend on the specific gene that's mutated. A completely different class of genetic changes are those that are acquired during uh, the disease. These are called somatic. Uh, they occur in the body tissue, not uh, generally in the germ cells or sperm and egg cells. Uh, these are restricted to the tumor cells, and the mutations have implications for such things as prognosis and uh, what's called now precision or personalized medicine. Some of these changes can help us to define the best therapy that might work in a particular individual's tumor. Uh, all tumors uh, are different. Uh, some tumors, such as chronic myeloid leukemia, uh, classically have a single chromosome alteration. Uh, the Philadelphia chromosome translocation, but most of the solid tumors have many genetic alterations, and by identifying the breadth of genetic changes in a personalized way, one has a better idea which genes might serve uh, as targets or indicate pathways that might be targets for therapies. So before there was ever molecular genetics, people could look at the genome by looking at the chromosomes. In a normal person's cells, there are 46 chromosomes. Uh, these are the chromosomes from one cell of a mesothelioma. Um, you can see that there are some chromosomes that are missing. Uh, I hope I don't move the slides when I do this. Uh, but you can see that there's a missing two, there's a missing 22. Uh, so there are less than 46 chromosomes, but in addition, all of the chromosomes that have arrows indicate that there's something structurally the matter with those chromosomes. Usually it's a deletion uh, of a, a part of a chromosome. And we now know that uh, the genes that are responsible for uh, mesothelioma seem to have been right before our eyes when we looked at cytogenetics. Both copies of these chromosome nines have a part of their chromosome that's abnormal and we now know uh, that there is a gene that encodes uh, P16 and ARF. These are two tumor suppressor genes that are involved in the uh, two of the most important pathways in cancer, the retinoblastoma and uh, P53 pathways, and they're usually homozygously deleted. Uh, there's another gene on chromosome 22, another tumor suppressor gene. One copy is mutated, and the second copy you can see the second copy of chromosome 22 is lost, so that second copy of NF2 is lost. So again, you have both copies of a gene uh, altered. And um, way back in the 1990s, we had identified that there was a, a region where there were subtle deletions in chromosome 3 in at least 60% of, of uh, mesotheliomas, and we narrowed this down to a region that uh, Mark Ladani's group subsequently found, and, and we confirmed that there are somatic mutations of a gene called BAP1, which will be the subject of much of what we talk about uh, today. So 
There are also somatic mutations. Those were somatic mutations I was referring to in mesothelioma in that previous slide. These are also somatic mutations in a BAP1 in uveal melanoma, which is a kind of eye cancer. You can see um, there are some of these uh, eye cancers, Dr. Um, um, in, in the, this one is in the cornea, uh, in the iris rather, this one is in the ciliary body, and this is a massive tumor that Dr. Bill Harbour will speak about in, in a moment. Uh, he had a, a front page um, article um, about, uh, oh, several months ago in the, the New York Times um, in terms of personalized medicine. That in other words, it's not the size of this tumor. This is a massive tumor. This doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad prognosis. This one could actually have a bad prognosis if it has the BAP1 mutation, because what, what Dr. Harbour found is that if you have a mutation of BAP1 somatically, it means that there's very a great likelihood that it's going to metastasize, that tumor will move to the liver and will kill that patient. So it's an uh, incredibly important marker uh, of a, a very bad prognostic indication in a particular patient's tumor. And what he had seen, this is so recurrent that almost 85% of patients uh, who have metastasizing tumors um, have this mutation. Now, for those of you who've never seen a, um, a pedigree, um, I'll now move to hereditary mutations. This is a high-risk cancer family. It's a classical uh, BRCA1 family. Um, many of you have heard of BRCA1. It's a, a mutation that occur in the germline and be passed from uh, one generation to the next to the next. These one, two, and three indicate the generations. Males are indicated by the boxes. The uh, circles indicate the females. All of these females are getting either breast cancer or ovarian cancer, and they all have a mutation of a tumor suppressor gene known as BRCA1. There are many examples of uh, cancer syndromes where, so BAP1 isn't the only one, there are at least 25 that I could identify here where you can have a mutation of a gene that might predispose to multiple tumor types. So it's not uh, unprecedented for a, a mutation to lead to, to a family having several different kinds of cancers. So you can see here if you have a mutation of either BRCA1 or related gene called BRCA2. You can have breast cancer in the family, ovarian cancer. If you have BRCA2, you can also have prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer, and even melanoma. If you have a mutation of the P53 gene, another tumor suppressor gene, uh, this causes Lee Fraumini syndrome. And you can have breast, uh, breast cancers, carcinomas, sarcomas, brain cancers, uh, adrenocortical cancers, and in fact, there's even been an example of a patient who had a P53 mutation in the germline who developed mesothelioma. So uh, I became involved as a result of Janet Raleigh suggesting to uh, Dr. McKelly Carboni that um, he contact uh, um, myself and also um, uh, uh, investigators at the um, University of Chicago who were, Nancy Cox, who was looking at um, ways to identify genes using a, a technique called linkage analysis. Um, so this was part of a, a large program project with the study rationale uh, listed here being that generally only a small fraction of all asbestos exposed individuals, even individuals who work in asbestos mines, uh, probably only about 5 to 8 percent of individuals that will develop mesothelioma. Why is that? Why don't you have 100 percent of them developing mesothelioma? On the other hand, you get clustering of mesothelioma in some families, and therefore we think that some families uh, harbor a genetic predisposing factor, and this study um, led by Dr. Carboni eventually did find that that was the case. So we had detailed pedigrees um, that Haining Yang and, and Others uh, developed, um, and we had blood from uh, these individuals, uh, both the affected uh, individuals who developed mesothelioma and other members of the family. And we also had uh, just a few cases where we had uh, solid tumors from those same uh, families. 
So the blood was used for the hereditary studies, the germline studies, and the tumor was to look for somatic uh, mutations. Sometimes if you identify a somatic mutation, it can tell you what the hereditary uh, uh, change might be. So uh, both of those studies were important in leading to the discovery of this gene. Uh, neither one of these two families, one in Louisiana and one in uh, Wisconsin, Neither one of these families had exposure to high levels of asbestos or arianite. Uh, there were no um, occupational exposures in the families, uh, although there were trace amounts of asbestos found in their homes. So these are the two families. Um, all of the orange, just to make it um, uh, simplified, I have all of the orange uh, indicating mesothelioma throughout all the slides I'll show. Um, so you can see that this um, is this disease is being passed from generation to generation, from this, uh, these parents here to the, the offspring and to, their, uh, to the third generation. Uh, some of these individuals have uh, breast cancer as well as mesothelioma, for example. Um, in this family, you have two that are highlighted in green. These are individuals who had those eye tumors, the uveal uh, melanomas, including one patient who had both mesothelioma and uveal melanoma, and that's going to be something that is repeated over and over again, just as it is in some other kinds of cancer syndromes. In fact, there was a paper uh, in Science just this past week where one uh, woman, who, it wasn't a BAP1 mutation, it was actually something that's involved in telomerase, which Dr. Carboni and I studied uh, maybe seven, eight years ago, where a mutation in this gene actually led to one woman having six different cancers. So uh, Dr. John Min Pei and my group um, had, about two years before we published this work, uh, come to the conclusion that he had seen uh, that BAP1 was actually the, the gene. Uh, what we show here is just a segment of chromosome 3P21. It's within a much longer region within this chromosome. And what he identified in these two tumors, one from Wisconsin and one from Louisiana, that there were mutations, both of which targeted either the loss of uh, BAP1 in this case, both copies of BAP1 were lost, or in this case there was a mutation in a region that regulates the expression of the gene. It's called the promoter part of the gene. So in both cases, he thought uh, this uh, BAP1 was the gene. Um, we weren't t entirely convinced because uh, Nancy Cox group um, uh, was doing linkage studies and on the family, um, W, it strongly implicated a small region in a completely different chromosome, chromosome 6. Uh, however, later linkage at that chromosome vanished when a presumed unaffected person developed cancer, uh, I think, in their 80s. So uh, linkage investigators have to make certain assumptions, and one of the assumptions is, is that, well, if a person doesn't have a cancer by that age, probably they're not affected. Once they looked at that person's genotype, uh, it's com completely different than the other um, members of the family. So we were really depressed about that. Uh, um, uh, Dr. Masaki, or Mr. Masaki at the time, uh, was working on his PhD and was sequencing the entire chromosome 6 region and found no mutations. And of course, he wouldn't because that wasn't really the site. So we were really fa uh, fascinated one. One afternoon, uh, Mitchell uh, Chung and my group came to me and said, look, here's this paper. Um, and I had always been fascinated that mesothelioma and melanomas have a number of similarities. For example, they can both have alterations of P16. But the key point in, in Dr. Harbour's um, paper for us uh, was right here. One of the tumors harbored a frame ship mutation uh, that can totally destroy the, the protein product and it was germline in origin. So this was um, really exciting for us, and we immediately started to sequence, and Mitchell found, I won't go into the details, but this is a way that scientists look at uh, genes with this kind of fluorescent tag. You see greens and reds and blues and so forth, and what he found is that in both families, there was a mutation that changed uh, one nucleotide. Now, you, you remember there are three billion nucleotides in the genome, so it's, this would be like finding one uncapitalized letter in an encyclopedia. He found that mutation, 
And it turned out that mutation makes this gene produce a protein that is abnormal. It can't get where it's supposed to be in the nucleus. In the other family, he found that there was a stop codon, which immediately, in the middle of the protein, truncates it and makes it no longer be able to produce a full protein. So this was really exciting to us. And uh, then uh, Dr. Carboni's group, uh, um, uh, Masaki Nasu, um, who um, was sequencing earlier chromosome 6, now started to uh, uh, sequence sporadic tumors that were obtained from Dr. Pass and uh, Mary Hessdorfer. And what they found were germ germline mutations of BAP1 in two patients out of 26 these are sporadic, and they're finding these mutations in their blood, in their germline. So it means that maybe some patients who don't have a whole family with mesothelioma can have a germline mutation. Sometimes it might be just one that occurs de novo. It wasn't in the whole family. It just started to happen. Uh, this kind of thing happens all the time in, in our bodies. We're always at sustaining mutations. And if it's in the germline, that could be passed to your children. Um, both cases with these BAP1 mutations had frame shifts. Uh, that means that there's a change in the sequence order, so you no, no longer make a functional protein. And in fact, it truncated the protein, so it was no longer able to go where it's supposed to. And importantly, both sporadic mesothelioma patients had, um, uh, who had this uh, germline mutation also previously had uveal melanomas. Now, the chance of having those two tumors together is extremely uh, rare. Um, uh, the statistician that worked with us said it was something like one in a trillion that you could have a cancer that occurs only 3,000 patients a year for mesothelioma and only 1,500 patients a year for uveal melanoma. To have both of those, the odds are un incredible. Now we know in the literature there are now at least six cases like this, including uh, three that we haven't published yet. At the same time that our paper was published, Dr. Weissner and Despiker uh, reported in the same journal, unbeknownst to us, they didn't know about our work either, um, two families that had BAP1 mutations. But unlike ours, they found all of these melanocytic lesions throughout their bodies. Uh, they look like this. Uh, probably some of, some of you think you have one like that on your arm. I thought I did, um, but uh, I'm a hypochondriac. But, you know, they, they don't look like much. They're a little raised, dome-shaped. Uh, they're not black. They're slightly pinkish, uh, reddish. Uh, when you look at them by uh, pathologist view, then you start to see they don't look right. Some of these nuclei, the, the dark staining things are big. Some of them are small. Sometimes the cytoplasm is, is incredible. Um, and so this reveals a proliferation of these large epithelioid melanocytes. So interestingly, if you look at this um, family, there were also, so all these black and gray indicate, um, uh, these symbols here indicate that they had either these papillary melanocytic tumors that are all over the place. And now Dr. Carboni's group has found that uh, our two families from Wisconsin, Louisiana, also have some of these. Ma maybe not as many as these families, but they do have some, and he'll talk about that. And you see the two that have red symbols. These two had uveal melanomas. So once again, uveal melanoma is coming up. And more strikingly, uh, Dr. Spiker wrote me an email and said, uh, interested in your article, by the way, did any of your patients have these lesions? Because one of our patients now has turned out to have mesothelioma. And he went on to report uh, another family that has four or five um, mesotheliomas in the family, and only one of those patients had these lesions. So we don't know why. Why do, you, do some people manifest this syndrome as mesothelioma? Why do some others m manifest it as a melanocytic lesion? Do some, why do some that have a melanocytic uh, lesion change to have part of that lesion become malignant? Is it because of environmental exposures to sun, to asbestos? This is uh, all the area that we're all excited about working on right now. Uh, most of the things we do in life, everything from the intellect of your child, has a component that's genetic and has a component that's environmental. My guess is the same will be the case here. 
This is a new family that we've studied, and I wanted to point it out because we actually have four different members of this family that have two different cancers. The odds of that are very, very uh, unusual, but Jill O'Hare will talk about some of the evidence that she has that it may not be as rare as we think. And again, you see the, the um, uveal melanomas coming up in a patient who also had mesothelioma. So I'll turn now to the speakers about the most recent exciting results. Um, our overall goal for the session will be how do, the, how do genes play a role in mesothelioma, particularly with regard to a new hereditary cancer susceptibility syndrome that's being called the BAP1 cancer syndrome, uh, which predisposes to uh, meseth malignant mesothelioma, which is the MM, uveal melanoma, cutaneous melanoma, uh, atypical melanocytic tumors, such as the ones I, I was showing you earlier, and potentially other cancers, such as kidney cancer, perhaps breast cancer, perhaps uh, meningiomas. Uh, and what are the future implications of genetics, markers, um, and inflammation to this field? So I believe the first speaker is Dr. Carboni. Is, that, is this list correct? Uh, okay. Um, if you could all, if you have questions for this panel, if you could write them down on blue index cards, because we're, we're taking questions from Facebook and the audience, and we want to make sure that we sort of streamline the questions. Thank you. Um, so some of our uh, speakers uh, are incredibly uh, busy physicians. You heard um, earlier, um, for those who were in the patient, new patient uh, session, that many of these surgeons are on call at any time for their patients, Sundays, whatever. And so for them to be here is an honor and to have them speak, and some of them do have to get back. Um, so our first speaker is a, a surgeon, Dr. Harvey Pass uh, at NYU. Uh, Dr. Pass is, ha, has nearly 400 papers on the area of mesothelioma. You remember Mary uh, Hestorfer said that it's important that if you consider a surgeon, that you consider surgeons who really are in this field. This is not a, a game that you do occasional surgeries. You have to do a lot of these surgeries to do them right. Dr. Pass is the Stephen Banner Professor of Thoracic Oncology, the Vice Chairman of Research at the, in the Department of uh, Cardiothoracic Surgery and Director of the Division of Thoracic Surgery and Thoracic Oncology at NYU's uh, Langone Medical Center and School of Medicine. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Pass. Thanks, Joe. Um, for me, it is a game. Uh, the game is to find a cure. Um, so I'm really happy to be here at MARF again, or the Miso Foundation. Um, obviously, I've worked with everybody, and obviously, I've worked with the BAP1 people. This is not going to be about BAP1. Uh, I don't care whether you have a BAP1 mutation or not. I mean, I'm interested in just finding mesothelioma early. So that's what we're going to concentrate on with my lecture. And uh, I have to disclose now who I work with. So I work with these people, uh, and I get grants from these people, uh, and I have some patents. So um, what's the magnitude of the situation? The magnitude is that 27 and a half million people are going to be exposed to mesothelioma, or have been. Uh, we think that there's going to be a peak in the mesothelioma incidence in the next 35 years. But the financial burden of this, not only on the families, but on the countries, is extraordinary, as you can see. Uh, and in the United States, uh, it's a select few of 3,000, about. There's no real registry, but we think that's what it is. And we got to find it, but it's somewhere between 10 and 40 years. So that's a long time to be surveillancing somebody uh, who's exposed. Now, why would we want to do this? Well, this is my own personal experience in operating on mesothelioma. The big line that's over on the right are the patients that have a median survival of 48 months. Not everybody dies of mesothelioma, okay? So you need to be able to move these curves here that are the late stage patients up here. So that then the stuff that Mary was talking to you about, not only with surgery, can get the line up here. 
And that's what we'd want to do by trying to find things earlier because these are the early stage patients they get operated on and they do the best. So what makes for a good marker to try and find disease early? And what do you have to do to make sure it is a robust marker? And how do you have patients to be able to test this in? Well, good markers have to be sensitive. You want to have a marker that you can measure at such a low level that that low level is going to say it's a meso or not, or a patient is at high risk or something's going on. It also has to be specific. I'm not interested in markers that can find patients with inflammation from asbestos and also show that a patient has a mesothelioma. No, it has to distinguish patients who have asbestos but don't have meso and patients that have meso and also patients who have lung cancer and patients who have ovarian cancer because we're interested in specifically finding meso. But you're not going to screen everybody in the world for mesothelioma. So at least at the beginning, you have to screen high-risk individuals, grossly people in these families that you've heard about that may be familial mesotheliomas, certainly they fit, uh, and also people who have had an exposure to asbestos and a documented exposure. So how are you going to do this? So, so remember, you don't have a CT on everybody, so you have these people who are coming to see you. Now, which one of these patients are you going to be most concerned about? They both have asbestos exposure. This person does not have any fluid in his chest. This person does. But these patients come off the street. You haven't done the CT yet, and they have no symptoms. Because by definition, screening means you're screening asymptomatic patients. So you're going to miss this patient who has the effusion. And that effusion could be mesothelioma if you don't have some way of knowing when the patient visits you. I personally believe you ought to have a blood test. You ought to have a blood test that tells you something's going on that then points you to get the CT scan that then shows you there's a difference between this guy and this guy and you better do something about this. So essentially the bottom line here is that most of the patients will present with some sort of effusion. You're looking to find a marker that says a patient has an effusion and you're looking to find a marker that says the effusion is a meso. But how do you even determine who had a significant history of asbestos exposure? You know, you, you speak to people who work in the industry, yeah, I worked 10 years, but I really didn't go to the houses and take out stuff. Yeah, I've been working 40 years, I never wore a mask, I, I got the dust all the time. Those are different risk profiles of patients who could develop mesothelioma. So wouldn't it be nice at least if you had some sort of marker that said, oh, that guy got exposed with, with asbestos. Then you know who to screen for meso. Well, it has to do with all these pathways that asbestos does that maybe it will elicit something in the blood that you could measure from all this that may be just an inf inflama inflammatory uh, sort of protein. Well, from Dr. Carbone's lab, and you'll hear from Heining Yang and, and from McKelly about this, they're interested in a marker called HMGB1. And if you look at the levels of HMGB1 in patients who are non-smokers and not exposed to asbestos, patients who are smokers but not exposed to asbestos, and then patients who are asbestos exposed but don't have meso, you can see there's a difference between normal so-called people and patients who have been exposed to asbestos with this marker. There's a marker in the blood. But that marker persists if you have mesothelioma. So it's not going to distinguish between a patient who has asbestos injury versus mesothelioma. But it's pretty good maybe as a first line. This needs to be validated. Hopefully it'll be validated in a big NIH grant. So how about markers that are going to distinguish asbestos-exposed patients from meso-patients. Well, there is a litany of this, and I'll talk about some of these. The, 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 the gold standard, the, the granddaddy, is the SMRP, the mesomark. 
And that is a true marker. It's not the best marker in the world, but it is a marker that you should ask your physicians about because you can get it measured at a reference lab, although the FDA doesn't re measure it. It can be measured at a reference lab. And, if, and this is a study that we did that was a blinded study in which we had two places look at sera from patients who did or did not have mesothelioma. And what you found was that if the marker was no good, it would fall right on this 50% line. Well, SMRP at both places was able to distinguish asbestos from meso very well, and also in stage one and stage two cohorts. Early patients with mesothelioma was able to distinguish not quite as good, but still there's a signal. So SMRP is good for a baseline, and then you get treated and you see what happens. Here's, here's, here's another one uh, from our lab that's called osteopontin. And we published this a long time ago. Well, 2005 is a long time ago. Uh, and this marker looked great. It was, the, it was an area under the curve. It was 0.85 for SMRP. This was 0.9. And these are asbestos people, and these are mesos. You can see the difference in the levels, and everybody's excited because this is stage one, and there's a difference. Big hullabaloo. Problem is, uh, this molecule falls apart in serum over time. So it's not very good if it's left around standing. Not, unlike, not like SMRP, which is good for a long time. So what happened is that other people tried to duplicate this and they couldn't find it. But what they found, though, was if they looked in plasma, it did replicate. Now, what's the difference between plasma and serum? Plasma doesn't clot. Serum clots. So you can imagine when you make a clot in a tube and you're trying to measure a biomarker, all hell breaks loose with a marker that maybe has what's called a cleavage site, which osteopontin does. So when you start clotting, the cleavage site breaks and you lose the marker or you get fragments. So plasma is the answer to your cures for looking at biomarkers, in my opinion. So all of our stuff ever since has been, do has been done in plasma. Now, you know, when, when I was disappointed about this first marker, I said it's time to go back to the uh, sweatshop and find some more markers. So we did that. Now, how do we do that? Well, th this is the way we do it. We look at the genes that are different between tumor and normal. And how can we do that? Well, I can't show you. Yes, I can. So here's a meso specimen. This is the lung, and this is the peritoneum, which is the lining from the inside of the, chest, inside of the belly that comes out with it. This is not affected by mesothelioma. This is. So if you take a piece of this that's normal, but is the mother tissue that makes mesotheliomas, mesothelium, then you're comparing apples to apples with regard to the normal tissue and the real tumor. So we did that and did a whole bunch of genes that we looked at. The ones in yellow are, are some of the interesting ones. This is our old friend osteopontin, so that validated again. But there was one that I'd never heard of, which is down here, which was, which was a strange thing called EFEMP1 or fibulin. I never heard of it, never had any ideas. But there was some stuff in the literature about it being elevated in glioblastoma. Well, it turns out that glioblastoma, brain tumors, have a lot in common with mesotheliomas. Okay, so cut to the chase. This is what we published on this marker. This is plasma from patient's blood comparing to other patients' blood. So we're comparing mesothelioma levels of this marker to all the rest of these patients. And here you are with patients who have an asbestos exposure. So their, their level, and that's mesothelioma. And then you have the rest of these. And notice, these are patients that have a lot of effusions. Remember I talked about finding effusions before, about screening and that sort of stuff, and specificity? Well, these are all sorts of cancers that make fluid, but the levels of the fibulin are not nearly as high as with mesothelioma. And remember, this is not measuring the fluid, this is measuring in the blood. 
And so the sensitivity and specificity was great, and we can show that you can find it in early disease, stage one or stage two, and lo and behold, if you operate, even if I operate on the patient, you can show that the levels will go down, which is a good thing, and then unfortunately, if the patients recur, the levels go up. So maybe this is a marker that you can follow patients to see how they're doing also. It doesn't mean anything unless somebody else can do the data and say that it works. And my good friend sitting in the audience, Dr. D. Perot, partnered with me and he sent us his samples of mesothelioma and asbestos and I had no idea which was which. And all I did was measure fibulin from him and then I sent our data back to him and he told me whether we failed or not. Well, fortunately we didn't fail and it replicated pretty well it's never 100%, but this is a pretty good single marker replication for mesothelioma versus asbestos from the University of Toronto, so we were encouraged by that. You can also measure this in effusions, in the fluid itself from the patients. And the levels are extraordinarily high compared to other patients, meso, other patients, and you can even use it to discriminate from effusions from other people or from the plasma. So you see if you look at effusions from other types of effusions, there's a big difference between meso and other. If you look at benign effusions, things that happen not from cancer, but you look at the level of fibulin there, it's very low compared to meso. And if you look at other malignant effusions, lung cancer, ovarian cancer, breast cancer, lymphoma, that's the level of fibulin. There it is in mesothelioma. So for what it's worth, it looks like fibulin. It looks like a pretty good marker. And also, if you look in the fluid, you can also see that certain patients who have low levels of fibulin in the fluid do very well, while patients with high levels don't do very well. So maybe we can discriminate who we should be aggressive with, who, who should not get surgery, who, should, who, should, who we know is not going to have a good result with surgery. So, you know, that, what are other ways that you can look at markers in mesothelioma? Well, you need to know who's doing the research in industry, because industry has the toys that we don't have in academics sometimes. You can actually measure proteins in the blood by using DNA-like moieties, because these DNA, these nucleic acids, actually bind to proteins. So if you manufacture a whole bunch of nucleic acids that are specific for binding certain proteins, you can put the whole gamish together, you can elute off the proteins eventually, and then read the levels of the nucleic acids, which is specific for a given protein, just like a gene array, just like looking at hundreds of thousands of genes just that you're looking at proteins. We did the same sort of analysis that we did with fibulin. We looked at patients who had mesos, and we looked at patients who didn't, and we studied and then validated, and then we had other patients that we studied and validated who didn't have mesothelioma. This is a pretty good marker profile also using this platform. What this means is that if you took a certain number of these somomers, which is the way that you measure this with these nucleic acids, the discrimination is, ex is excellent, just about as good as fibulin. And it was both in the blinded verification set and also in early stage disease that you could distinguish meso. That wasn't good enough. We did another validation with a separate set of specimens from Sinai and from Libby and found the same verification. So this is another marker that marker panel that involves all these put together. Some of them are nonspecific. Some of them have to do with what meso is doing to the normal tissue. A lot of inflammatory cytokines, just like Dr. Carbone's group has shown with HMGB1. So this may come commercial in about six to 12 months. So I've shown you what's out there at this point. Obviously, there are other markers that I don't know about that 
my colleagues are doing that, that may be just as good, that may be published. But I think we're on the road to finding markers to find this disease earlier. We're on the road to finding markers that will help us tell us how the disease is doing. And the key thing, though, is everybody has to work together and establish a consortium of centers, which we are doing, trying with a spore as well as with all the people we work with, to do this together to validate it and then get more research funding to be able to start prospective screening trials with these markers to make sure they work. And then finally to design the proper protocols to be able to make sure that these validate. Couldn't do it without my lab team, specifically Chandra, uh, who does all the, the protein work in my lab, uh, as well as all my other people, PhDs and, and none such. Thanks very much. So do we want to do questions now? I mean, I'm going to be here until 12. Oh, yeah, okay. Does anyone have questions for Dr. Rafael? Does anyone have questions? I actually had one question. Uh, does, does somomers work for serum, or is it, again, plasma? Somomer works for serum. It will uh, actually work. It will work for plasma also. Okay. We've done both. Very exciting. Um, our, now our next speaker is um, uh, Dr. William Harbour. He was at the uh, University of Washington in St. Louis uh, for 16 years and uh, just recently uh, is, has moved to Miami. I guess he had been in Miami in years past uh, for part of his training. Uh, he's currently, I don't see him, Dr. Harbour. Maybe we'll move on to someone else, uh, Mary. I don't see him. Okay. Uh, so Dr. Harbour is uh, the Vice Chairman uh, for Translational Research and Director of uh, Ocular Oncology Service at the Bascom Palmer Eye Institute at the University of Miami, where he's uh, now directing a multidisciplinary team of physicians and scientists studying the genetics and genomics of the major eye tumors. It's a pleasure to have uh, uh, Dr. Harbour speak to us today. Well, it's a great pleasure for me to be here, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Testa, Dr. Caborni, and the other meeting organizers for having me. And. Um, you probably didn't think when you came here you were going to hear from an eye doctor. So first I want to, to uh, after uh, showing you my disclosure, uh, explain to you why you would uh, have an eye doctor here. And you've already gotten a, a hint of this from uh, Dr. Testa. Uh, this is a family that uh, came to me uh, after I recently moved to uh, Miami to join the Baskin Palmer Eye Institute. This family is from Louisiana, so I suspect that this contains many of the same members of uh, Dr. Tess and Dr. Carboni's family. But the interesting thing here, as you've already heard, is that uveal melanoma and mesothelioma are really the dominant um, cancer types uh, within uh, this family. So uh, I'll come back to that later, but first I just want to give you a little uh, background on uveal melanoma uh, or ocular melanoma. The uvea is a strange word uh, that um, uh, uh, it represents a tissue layer within the eye between the white coat on the outside of the eye, the sclera, and the retina on the inside, which is the visual part of the eye. This is a very vascular tissue that contains a lot of melanocytes. Uh, the part of the uveal tract that you're all familiar with is the iris, the colored part of your eye, and you can get melanomas here. You can also get melanomas uh, in the tissue just behind the, the iris, which is called the ciliary body, and then in the choroid. So sometimes you will hear these melanomas referred to as choroidal melanoma or ciliary body melanoma, but they're all uh, essentially uveal melanomas. 
the vast majority of patients, we can save their eye these days. Uh, up until a few decades ago, most of these patients had their eye removed. Uh, but we can now treat about 90% of them with um, sophisticated forms of uh, radiation treatment where we implant devices on the surface of the eye. We localize them with uh, ultrasound, as we see here. And uh, we have about a 98% success rate at, at saving the eye in these patients. Unfortunately, uh, and just a little bit more background on uveal melanoma, it's about 5% of all uveal melanomas, mostly in Caucasian uh, patients, and generally is thought of it, uh, as a non-familial uh, cancer. So we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, despite the successful treatment that I just mentioned, up to half of these patients, if they live long enough, they don't die from something else, will develop spread of their uh, uh, uveal melanoma. And most of the time, it goes uh, to the liver where it's uh, incurable. So um, we and others have uh, spent a lot of uh, time and effort trying to understand the genetics, the molecular underpinnings of this cancer. And the first thing we found uh, almost a decade ago now is that uh, there are really two flavors of uveal melanoma. Even though they look the same uh, uh, when, we're, when we're examining the patient, there are really two different uh, forms at a molecular basis. And we now call these forms class one and class two. The class one melanomas have a very low metastatic risk as seen here. The class two tumors have a very high metastatic risk uh, as seen here. And importantly, the um, class two tumors are associated with loss of chromosome three. And it's been known for many decades that loss of chromosome three was not a good uh, prognostic factor in uveal melanoma, but nobody really understood why. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, I guess almost three years ago now, um, we, were, we, we had looked every way we knew how on chromosome 3, uh, but there are thousands of genes on chromosome 3, and, and as Dr. Testa said, you're looking for one misspelled word in, uh, in, in, a, in, a, uh, in, the in the dictionary or the encyclopedia, uh, and it was very hard to do that until recently when a very sophisticated new technology became available, which all of us in cancer uh, research are now using. It's a way to very s rapidly sequence or read the entire genome very cheaply and, and, and easily compared to uh, previous um, uh, methods that we had. And by doing that, we discovered uh, that there was one and only one gene on chromosome 3 that was damaged, and it was only damaged in the class 2 metastasizing tumors. And of course, this was BAP1, which you've already heard about today. Uh, what we initially saw was that um, the uh, uh, mutations mostly damaged this part of the gene that, that has to do with its, act, uh, its activity uh, as an enzyme. Uh, interestingly, when you look at uh, the certain type of mutation that just specifically damages one part of the gene without destroying it, you can get further insights into what is it about the gene that's so important. And again, most of the mutations cluster in this area uh, that has to do with the activity of the enzyme, but there's also this other cluster of mutations down here, which I'll mention later. And as was mentioned, we were very surprised to find that one of these patients had a germline mutation. In other words, we found the mutation not only in the cancer, but in their peripheral blood, which means it's in all the cells in their body. And when I was in training, we were taught that uveal melanoma is never familial, it's never hereditary. So we were very surprised. We went back and rechecked this, and sure enough, it was, it was definitely the case. Unfortunately, this patient was um, uh, not available for further uh, questioning um, and uh, further evaluation. And so we turned to uh, some other families that we uh, knew had a strong hereditary or uh, apparent hereditary predisposition that we had collected blood from the past but really didn't know what to do with it. So when we went back and looked at one of these families, this is my patient right here uh, who had uveal melanoma. They had a sister with uveal melanoma, a brother with cutaneous melanoma, and uveal and cutaneous melanoma in another branch of the family. And indeed, they all had BAP1 uh, germline mutations. Uh, in this particular family, gastric cancer was a prominent uh, feature. However, uh, we were not able to actually confirm that those patients had BAP1 mutations because they were already uh, 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 expired. This is the family I just uh, showed you before. 
uh, where again, uveal melanoma and mesothelioma are the predominant uh, features, but you do again see gastric cancer, renal cell carcinoma, and a number of other cancers. Um, uh, th this is a summary of uh, Dr. Testa and Carboni's uh, work, Dr. Uh, Wiesner's uh, work, and a number of other papers. We, we see a paper almost once a month now of a new family or a new, uh, uh, a new association uh, um, between different cancers for this BAP1 familial cancer syndrome. Uh, this is an example of a patient who walked into my office um, a couple of weeks ago, he was only 17 years old, and he had a large tumor. Unfortunately, we had to remove his eye, and it's very unusual for a 17-year-old to get a uveal melanoma. And so I started thinking, you know, when you see young patients with cancer, you start thinking maybe there's a hereditary component. And I said, do you happen to have any moles on your skin? And he said, well, yes, I've had quite a few taken off. And I said, can you show me some? Uh, that are still there, and here you go, this sort of typical BAP1 uh, um, associated melanocytic uh, uh, nevus or mole that looks different from your typical uh, mole that, that most of us have. So uh, there's a growing list of cancers associated with this syndrome. The ones at the top of the list, again, are, are mesothelioma and uveal melanoma. Um, there are a number of other cancers that, are, that, that vary in the uh, degree of scientific rigor with which they have been associated with the syndrome. Now, why is it that uh, so many of us have been studying uh, these different cancers for so many years and never saw this uh, association uh, before between uveal melanoma and mesothelioma or in uveal melanoma even seeing familial uh, cancer? And I think uh, the, at least one answer to that is you need to have large families with lots of offspring before you will see the occurrence because the, um, the chance of getting any one cancer is not that high. The chance of getting some cancer is pretty high. But if you're only looking at one type of cancer, you may not see the pattern in a particular family unless you have a pretty large family. Here, this, uh, this family here had eight siblings. Uh, if they had only had two siblings, uh, two children, we may not have seen the pattern at all. So in, in, for any individual cancer, the, what we call the penetrance, the chance of it penetrating to the next generation is relatively low, but when you look at all, the overall cancer burden, it's clearly much higher uh, than you would expect. So I'm going to quickly go through some of the research that we and others are doing trying to figure out what in the world is this BAP1 uh, gene doing and the protein that it produces that is so, uh, uh, so strongly associated with cancer. And uh, this is really just a summary slide uh, that says it does a lot of stuff and we don't really understand it yet. Um, the, 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 the part that it was missing from this really excellent review is the association of BAP1 with uh, the control of stem cells. And stem cells, as you've heard, I'm sure, uh, are, are cells in our body that are not fully committed to become one type of cell or another. We're born with many stem cells in our body, and as we grow and mature, the number of stem cells decreases. As our, uh, as our arm develops, for example, we, we eventually all the cells in the arm become arm cells, and they, they, they cease to become stem cells. However, uh, in cancer, one of the things we're starting to understand is that these cells that were once committed to being a skin cell or a brain cell, they start to drift back to this less differentiated or less committed state where they can start to, uh, to, to do mischievous things. And we think that at least in some small way, that's what's happening with BAP1 loss in uveal melanoma. We think that BAP1 is somehow controlling the differentiated state of uveal melanocytes. And when you lose BAP1, you start to evolve more towards a, a, a stem-like state. Uh, this is, uh, for example, these are uh, uh, class one melanoma cells right out of a patient where we have knocked uh, out the BAP1 and they start to ball up into these epithelioid cells. And we know that epithelioid morphology is strongly associated with the class two 
gene expression profile and with BAP1 loss, and you've already heard that epithelioid morphology is associated with BAP1 mutation in mesothelioma, and it's also associated with BAP1 loss in cutaneous melanoma. So there's something about this epithelioid morphology that's strongly associated with BAP1. We're not sure what it means, but we think that at a, at a minimum, what it means is that these cells no longer look like melanocytes. They're not sort of star-shaped, um, differentiated cells anymore, and they look more like stem cells. And this is a very busy slide that I'm not going to go through, except to point out that we've done many, many uh, types of experiments to understand what happens to uv melanoma cells when you lose BAP1, and they all point to uh, this regulating a stem cell type uh, uh, change in the cells that allow them to drift away from where they're supposed to be and to start doing things they're not supposed to do, like spread to the liver and start growing. Um, we've uh, identified a, a potential therapeutic target for uh, cells that have lost BAP1. Uh, these are called uh, histone deacetylase inhibitors, or HDAC inhibitors. And some of these are, uh, were mentioned earlier today, SAHA is, 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 uh, is a HDAC inhibitor. Um, there are even uh, uh, drugs like valproic acid, which have been around for years, that are used uh, for seizures that actually have HDAC uh, inhib inhibitory activity. And what we've found is that um, when you lose BAP1, you get an increase in something called ubiquitination of histones, which we think is, might be key to what's, uh, what's uh, going wrong when you lose BAP1. And we showed that if you uh, treat the cells with, a, with an HDAC inhibitor, you can reverse this, this biochemical defect. And that's associated with a shift from these more stem-like cells back to a differentiated uh, morphology um, in these melanoma cells and a shift from class two back to class one in their expression profile and a uh, reestablishment of a differentiated uh, uh, gene expression profile. And finally, we were able to show in an animal model that uh, valproic acid uh, can uh, blunt the growth of uv melanoma tumors in, in the animal. So uh, just want to shift gears here for a second and go back to uh, this, uh, what I was mentioning earlier, that uh, many of the mutations that uh, affect BAP1 are damaging the activity of the enzyme. But there's this other cluster down here of mutations, both in uh, missense mutations in tumors and in germline mutations, that are not really, they're, they're not directly affecting this uh, catalytic activity. Um, there, there are a number of other activities down at this end of the gene. One is uh, where BRCA1 binds, and another is this nuclear localizing signal that Dr. Testa mentioned earlier that's required to get the protein into the nucleus. But uh, uh, Dr. Frank Rauscher at the Wistar Institute, who we have been working with to understand some of the mutations that we find in patients, has come up with a really fascinating uh, discovery that, the, um, that this end, what we call the C-terminus of the protein, is actually required for the catalytic activity at the other end of the protein through a, an, uh, a, a, a folding of the protein. Uh, from one end to the other. And when you uh, 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 cover, well, it has to do with where the active site is located and uh, accessed for the ubiquitin here, which I'm going to skip over. But the, the bottom line is that these tumor-associated mutations are clustering right in this area that allows this folding of the protein. When you can't get the folding of the protein, then BAP1 no longer binds this important partner called ASXL, there's an ASXL1, 2, and 3. And when that's blocked, then you don't get the, the enzyme activity that you need. So he's working on a very interesting strategy for th uh, therapy, which is to somehow stabilize this uh, folding of the protein. So this is an interesting area where uh, even though we, we made these inroads uh, with uveal melanoma, the findings in this basic research could, may well apply to mesothelioma and other cancers as well. So uh, just summarizing, uh, we've now learned a lot about uveal melanoma and um, uh, th that this BAP1 mutation seems to be uh, uh, strongly associated with the switch to a, a metastasizing phenotype. Uh, what I didn't talk about today is we more recently discovered the, a mutation which is mutually exclusive with BAP1 
that uh, seems to be associated with a better prognosis. We published this a, a month or two ago in Nature Genetics. Now, the interesting thing is that whether you develop a uvia melanoma um, from a germline mutation in BAP1 or whether it's acquired somatically, you still have to have an initiating mutation. The BAP1 mutation does not initiate the cancer. And that's true also in cutaneous melanoma. You need an initiating mutation in something like uh, BRAF. Uh, I'm not sure if that's also the case in mesothelioma or not. Um, but, uh, but, but there is a certain sequence of genetic events which is necessary for uh, uv melanoma. So in closing, I hope I can convince you that, uh, that, that, uh, that, that um, even though I'm not studying mesothelioma directly, that the research that we do uh, may have some insights into mesothelioma and vice versa. And in fact, what we're really starting to understand as cancer researchers is that we're, we're thinking less about uh, grouping cancers in terms of their anatomic location and more about their similarities biologically and genetically. And in other words, instead of thinking as all lung cancers is the same or all breast cancers is the same or all brain cancers is the same, we really are thinking, well, there are some brain cancers and some lung cancers and some uh, other kinds of cancers that are very similar to each other and it doesn't really matter so much whether they're anatomically located as much as the, the biological uh, properties that they have in common because that's going to be what drives our development of new therapies. So in conclusion, uva melanoma and mesothelioma are the two defining cancers of this new BAP1 uh, cancer syndrome. Uh, as far as I know, there was no known association between them before this uh, exciting work came out from many groups simul almost simultaneously a few years ago. Uh, I think one reason that it was not noticed before is that the chance of getting any particular cancer when you have this uh, germline mutation is not high. So you need to see a lot of family members before the pattern comes out. BAP1 mutations seem to be associated uh, very strongly with metastasis, but because of this germline association, it clearly can be involved with uh, progression of the primary cancer as well. And then BAP1, uh, the, the role of BAP1 in all of these dif different cancers is going to differ somewhat depending on the cancer type and, and, and so forth. But I think what we learn from one cancer is going to be very important for uh, informing our understanding of the other cancers. And I just want to acknowledge the people that have worked with me on this project and our sources of funding. Thank you. That's a great question. Uh, no, it was a typical Midwest Caucasian uh, family. But again, uh, you know, I hasten to add that we were not able to confirm that those patients had a germline BAP1 mutation uh, that they had already expired. Other questions? Thank you. So is there any other speaker that has more of an urgent need to catch a plane, or can I just go in the order that's here? All right, then the, the next investigator I have uh, speaking is uh, Dr. McKelly Carboni, a longtime colleague um, and one of the major figures in all of mesothelioma, perhaps the uh, most well-funded uh, mesothelioma researcher at, at this time. Uh, Dr. Carboni is the professor of pathology and director of the University of Hawaii uh, Cancer Center. Um, he discovered mechanisms for asbestos carcinogenesis, um, implicated also SV40 as a possible role, and more recently has, in addition to the BAP1 work, 
been making very interesting uh, inroads into our understanding of whether or not inflammation plays an important role in uh, the development of mesotheliomas. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Carboni. Are you going to? Oh. oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. All right, well, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> All right, then, Heining, you're going to speak? Okay, then uh, instead we will move on to Dr. Heining Yang, who is an assistant professor at the University of Hawaii, um, who also has been working um, uh, on uh, the BAP-1 story, but um, has an independent program looking at the role of inflammation in um, uh, mesothelioma and this role of HMGB1. Um, Heining Yang. Okay, good morning. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share some of our research findings. Uh, so uh, today I'm going to talk mainly on HMGB1. Later, Dr. Carboni is going to talk uh, about uh, more on uh, BAP1 and probably the relationship on HMGB1 and BAP1. So um, what we found recently is that HMGB1 really plays an important role in methylioma pathogenesis. So you heard earlier um, in this meeting by various people, uh, especially Mary, that uh, malignant mesothelioma really caused a uh, 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 significant amount of uh, deaths. And in the United States, about 3,000 deaths per year. And uh, worldwide, there are about 100,000 deaths per year. And we all know that asbestos and aeronite uh, exposure is one of the main causes uh, that uh, leads to mesothelioma development. Um, and uh, so there is a long latency, we all know, somehow between first exposure to the disease development. And there is a big variation between 20 years to 50 years, sometimes even longer. So this latency gave us a window if there is a way we can prevent the development so we can save a lot of life. And currently, unfortunately, only very low percentage, about 8% of mesothelioma patients were diagnosed in the early stage, stage one, which normally has better survival. But since the patient, when they develop symptoms, is already late stage, so the prognosis is not very good, and the median survival time is only about one year. So there is urgent need. We all know that we need to find some better treatment to, to uh, treat the patient and find the cure, hopefully, soon. And here is basically an image of uh, asbestos fibers that uh, cause mesothelioma. So when I started my research uh, about more than 10 years ago, uh, I tried to understand the mechanism how asbestos cause mesothelioma. So here is just one slide showed some of the interesting uh, puzzle, the question that uh, uh, confused me and many scientists uh, in the very beginning. So we all know that asbestos causes mesothelioma, but however, in tissue culture, if you treat the cells, expose the cells to asbestos fiber, you don't see the cell transformation or become a malignant. Instead, you see cell death. So here on the left, there is normal cultured uh, mesothelial cells. And uh, once you expose the cells to asbestos, very few cells alive, and very soon all of them die. So how come a cell, uh, 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 asbestos fiber that causes cell death can induce tumor? So that, in fact, is a research question I started. So during all this year study, we found some uh, important mechanisms that is related to asbestos carcinogenesis. And we published the paper in PS 2006 and 2010. And here basically is a figure summarize our research findings. We found that although asbestos cause mesothelial cell death, but the cell type or the type of cell death is called necrotic, programmed necrotic cell death. 
So a protein called HMG1 is released. This is a very important factor induce pro-inflammatory response and cause macrophages and all the immune cells accumulate and secrete cytokine like TNF alpha. So this cytokine binds to receptor, activates some uh, cell signaling pathway, especially nf kappa B, which makes the cell survive. But the cell survive carries the damage caused by asbestos. So you have pool of cells which survive but has a damage. Basically, that pool of cells sooner or later will become malignant and uh, probably leads to the development of cancer. So here I just show a um, slide summarizing what is HMGB1. Uh, HMGB1 is a very unique protein. So in normal cells, it stays in the nucleus. However, under certain circumstances, it goes to the cytoplasm of the cells or even release outside of the cells. Um, only after 2000, people found that once HMG band is released outside, it has totally different function compared to the, the HMG band inside of the cells. And I'm going to mainly focus on this type of HMG band. In fact, this extracellular HMG band induces inflammation that leads to the development of cancer. And also, it can drive cell migration and proliferation, which leads to the uh, progression of the tumor, which I'm going to talk uh, later. So I don't have the time to show the detail of the uh, research finding, which I will, in fact, talk more in tomorrow's science session. So I just show briefly some of the uh, slides, which we found that HMGB1 uh, is released outside the cells once you expose the cells to asbestos. You can see that in other in untreated cells, HMG band is in the nucleus, but in asbestos exposed cells, you went to extracellular uh, space and all, also in the cytoplasm. And the release of HMG band induces TNF alpha secretion, and by blocking HMG band, you can reduce the inflammatory response induced by HMG band. And this result we confirmed in the animal. Basically, if you inject mice with asbestos, you start seeing chronic inflammation. And if you do staining, you see a lot of HMGB1 and TNF alpha secretion. In those sites, there is a lot of asbestos fibers. So in fact, this result in the lab make us to think how about human being? How about those people who has been exposed to asbestos? Whether HMG1 also go up in their blood? So with the help of Dr. Harvey Pass, uh, we tested some serum uh, from those asbestos workers, as Harvey mentioned previously in his presentation. Compare those serum to unexposed people and also to the heavy smokers who have lung inflammation. And we found that only in asbestos exposed people HMG1 levels in the blood is significantly induced compared to smoker and non-exposed. The level is low. So this makes us all think, OK, HMG1 probably can be a biomarker for exposure, as Harvey mentioned previously. So as I showed previously, HMG1 is really a critical uh, factor driving the process of inflammation and also induce the tumor development. This also makes us think if we can find some inhibitors to target HMG1 or target the inflammatory response, we can probably find a way to prevent the tumor development. So we are going to do some clinical trial that I'm going to talk later. So here is, in fact, some in vitro study. We show that, uh, in fact, indeed, by inhibiting HMG1, we can inhibit cell transformation inhibit the cell become malignant. Here is just one slide I summarize that experiment. Basically, we co-culture macrophages and methylated cells, expose the cells to asbestos. After about two months, you start seeing foci formation, which indicate the cells start get transformed. But if we treat the cells with inhibitor of HMG1 to block the pathway induced by HMG1, either using the boxy, which is a tanganist inhibiting HMGB1, or the monoclonal antibody also targeting HMGB1, we can always inhibit foci formation. 
which indicate this probably uh, is a potential novel way to prevent mesothelioma development. Um, how about established tumor uh, about those people who already have mesothelioma, whether HMG1 is still critical for the tumor progression? We found that, in fact, in the tumor tissue we got from the patient, HMG1 level is very, very high compared to normal pleura, which you can see the level is very low, and HMG1 only in stay in the nucleus. Instead, in the tumor tissue, HMGB1 is not just high, but also beside nucleus, is also in the cytoplasm of the cells. And it even released to the blood. So here is a serum from a tumor patient we compared with the normal people. How we showed these slides before. In a tumor patients, the serum level of HMGB1 is also significantly higher than the normal people. However, whether this level is, is higher or uh, no significant difference compared to exposed people, we need to do further study to see whether HMG1 is just a biomarker for exposure, or it can also be a biomarker for tumor development. So we did also a lot of study using cell lines in vitro in cell culture. We noticed that all the mesothelium or tumor cell lines express very high level of HMG1 and also its receptor rich. And we confirm this result using the staining. You can see all the tumor lines express very high, but normal cells don't, much, uh, don't express much HMG1. And the tumor cells also secrete HMG1 into the extracellular space. So that indicates that HMG1 is really critical in the microenvironment to help the tumor growth. And we did a lot of experiment confirming those data and the result. So I only have the time to show a few slides. Basically, we show that HMGB1 play a critical role, helps the tumor growth. And if we targeting HMGB1, here we use three different type of inhibitors, including box A, or the antibody targeting HMGB1, or the antibody targeting HMGB1 receptor. All of these basically inhibit the function of HMGB1. By targeting HMGB1, we can always slow down the tumor, kill the tumor cells, and slow down the tumor growth. And here is a colony formation in software agar assay. You can see also untreated cells form big colony. So it's IgG control. But if we use the inhibitor of HMGB1, including box A, or anti-HMGB1 antibody, or anti-RIDGE, which is a receptor antibody, we can always reduce the size and also the number of the colony in the cell culture. Here is an animal experiment we did. You can see that without any treatment, the tumor grows pretty fast in the mouse. But if we inhibit HMGB1, here we use antibody, you can see the growth rate of the tumor is slowed down significantly compared to untreated cells. Here is another inhibitor, it's a box I mentioned. It's a antagonist of HMGB1, also targeting HMGB1 function. This is a significant difference. This is mice treated with box A compared untreated. You can see the tumor growth is reduced, inhibited significantly. And this is mice survival with the treatment with box A compared to untreated mice. You can see also the survival is very much improved. In fact, one of the mice in the end, we couldn't even detect uh, the, the tumor, so which is really amazing. So we are going to conduct some clinical trial with the help of uh, or some company going to test this. I'm going to also uh, talk later. Basically, our those data I presented were published in Cancer Research 2012, and uh, the editor even put our story on the cover page in that issue. So to summarize, basically we found that a specially exposed individual and uh, mesothelioma patients have very high serum levels of HMGB1. And HMGB1 is critical for mesothelial cells transformation and mesothelioma development. Mesothelioma cells are addicted to HMGB1, and HMGB1 is critical for mesothelioma growth and progress. So therefore, because 
a specific exposed individual and the patient has a high level of HMGB1. So we think that HMGB1 can be a potential biomarker for exposure and probably can be a biomarker for methylioma early detection. So at this moment, we don't know. That is why we want to conduct clinical trial in Monsanto, which I'm going to talk uh, in the next slides, to test whether it's good biomarker. And also, since we found that HMGB1 is critical to uh, mesothelioma development and uh, the cell transformation, so we think it can be a potential target for mesothelioma prevention in those high-risk cohorts who have been exposed to asbestos PP4 and who are in the risk of developing mesothelioma. And last, we also think that since mesothelial cells need HMGB1 to grow and to progress, so we think it can be a potential target for mesothelioma therapy. So here, I will just uh, spend some time to explain some of the clinical trials we are going to conduct uh, very soon. Hopefully, we'll start in April this year. And uh, Dr. Andy Todd is helping us to uh, put this clinical trial together. So first clinical trial we are going to uh, do is to test whether HMGP1 can be a potential biomarker for specific exposure and for mesothelioma early detection. So this is clinical trial going to conduct in a uh, Masana cohort. Uh, basically, we are going to enroll 200 asbestos ex exposed individuals, either um, insulator or skin fitter, from the Masana cohort. And uh, we will do a, follow them for five years. And the CT scan uh, at the enrollment will be evaluated for lung fibrosis, pleural thickening, and or scarring, which are the markers for asbestos exposure. And we will also have 200 age and sex matched non-exposed individual to set up the baseline for HMGB1 serum level in the healthy population. So we can compare these two uh, population. And uh, we will follow those people and measure HMGB1 in the blood in the serum every six months for five years. So after this, this study, we will be able to validate whether HMGB1 can be a marker of exposure, but also investigate the association between serum or even plasma HMGB1, the uh, trend and the methylioma development. So another uh, try that we hope to start soon is to test whether HMGB1 can be a potential target for therapy. As I showed previously that we found using inhibitor of HMGB1 such as box A, we can definitely slow down the tumor growth and increase the survival significantly. So we are want to test uh, whether we can put uh, uh, box A to clinical trial. We are working on some investigators and collaborators now. Besides that, another reagent that is already in clinical trial but in different disease called CT637 is a derivative of box A, which seems to be more stable. Uh, so we are going to work with the com company Kriblis for conducting some uh, study to test uh, what is the effect and whether it's better or simple to box A. Uh, another study, in fact, I would like to mention is about aspirin. So as you heard previously in my talk, um, Chronic inflammation is very much related to mesothelioma development. So this also makes us think, if we use some anti-inflammatory drug, whether we can inhibit HMGP1 and also inhibit uh, tumor development. One of the well-known anti-inflammatory drug is aspirin. And aspirin is well-known that it has very low toxicity. Many people taking that. And also it has proven uh, efficacy in reducing the incident of colorectal cancer, and there are a lot of study on that, and there are some more study on breast cancer as well. And through my uh, connection with Harvard University, one of my friends, she works there, and she has access to a previous study called Physician Health Study. And in that study, there were about 22,000 physicians were enrolled and followed for 24 years. and. Uh, those physicians, some of them taking placebo, some of them taking aspirin, 325 milligram every other day. So in that study, my friend, uh, 
take a look, and uh, she did analysis, and she found that in fact there are about 17 cases of mesothelioma developed or reported in those cohorts in that study. And after analysis, she found that there is an intention to treat analysis comparing aspirin to placebo revealed a relative risk of 0 0.7. What does this mean? This means that in the, in the aspirin taking group, since the risk of mesothelioma development is reduced 30%. However, because the number is too small, after analysis, she said the number is too small to give any statistical power for the significance. However, although there is, we cannot see there is a significant difference, but the result indicates a possible association between aspirin use and reduced methylomer incidence. So we did some study in the lab. So we treat uh, the mice. We first give the mice aspirin and some of the uh, uh, asbestos, and some of the mice taking or giving aspirin. Oh, another inhibitor of HMGB1. We found that the mice treated with aspirin, the level of HMGB1 in the blood is reduced significantly. And here is the mice inject with mesothelioma tumor cells. Without aspirin, HMGB1 level is high. But if we give aspirin, the level is reduced. Here is another study using aspirin. We test the tumor growth in the mice. You can see that without treatment, the tumor grows pretty fast. Here we gave the mice the garage feeding of aspirin. You can see it seems the tumor growth is slowing down. Here we use another way, put the aspirin into the food, into the feed to feed the mice. And you can see also the mice eating aspirin containing feed seems to have slower growth in the tumor. So this makes us also um, think probably we should conduct another clinical trial. And also thanks to Dr. Andy Todd is helping us put this uh, together to do a clinical trial to test whether HMG1 can be a potential target for methylioma prevention in high risk cohorts. So we are going to test also aspirin, whether aspirin can reduce HMGB1 level, which can tell us probably that will influence some of the low HMGB1 readings in the patient or in the exposed cohorts. But the result also can indicate whether aspirin can be a potential preventive drug to prevent tumor development in those cohorts. So this clinical trial is a prospective double blind, double crossover, and those escalation study, we will increase the amount of aspirin from baby aspirin 81 milligram up to 650 milligram to see whether that can influence the level of HMGB1 in the blood of those individuals. And for this study, we are going to enroll 40 asbestos exposed individuals with high serum levels of HMGB1. And the participant will be randomized to take aspirin or placebo and we will draw 10 milliliter blood uh, to start of the aspirin and then every two weeks for a total about uh, uh, eight times during the study. Um, so basically that is uh, what we are going to do in the clinical trial to, to understand better what is the role of HMGB1 and what can we do to help the patient in the future. And here is the research findings uh, that supported my study. I got R1 about two years ago, and recently, uh, Dr. Carbone and I, we got a V Foundation. He's a clinical PI, I'm the basic science PI. And about uh, one month ago, I very luckily also got a DOD uh, award. Uh, my research also helped by Rivera um, Foundation grant, and also by uh, Mrs. Leomer Applied Research Foundation who in fact is uh, uh, one of the first uh, award I got which helped me to initiate all the studies and also Hawaii Community Foundation gave me help. Thank you very much. This is a teamwork. I got tremendous uh, support from various people, especially Dr. Caboni. And uh, Sandra, Sandra Jube is a postdoc working with me who basically developed most of the study result. Thank you very much.
this a list of questions? Okay. Okay. Um, so has anyone looked to see if long-term mesothelioma survivors have lower levels of HMG B1? Yeah, we haven't. In fact, we only test a very small uh, number of cells, about 20 to 30 serum. So we would like to test uh, the different survival people to see whether this level HMG B1. We tested, although the stage, only in the tissue, we did immunostaining. We did find that the higher stage, like stage three and four, have high level expression HMG1 in the tissue compared to the stage one to the early stage. So that indicate probably it's related to survival, although we, we, we haven't tested the serum yet, yeah. Okay, so then I can make a suggestion from the foundation possibly that I can introduce you to the long-term survivors that are in all our groups, and perhaps we can get a study underway. What do you sure. think? Yeah, okay. that would be wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Laura Ferris, uh, I'm going to have uh, Laura speak next, then uh, Jill O'Hara, and we're going to end with uh, Dr. Carboni. Uh, Laura Ferris is the Director of Clinical Trials and an Assistant Professor of Dermatology at the University of Pittsburgh uh, School of Medicine. It's delightful to have you uh, give a presentation to us today. Okay, thank you very much for um, having me here. And um, I am a dermatologist, so probably the last physician you thought would be up here in front of you, um, in addition to an ophthalmologist. But you've heard a lot of mention about skin lesions in patients with mesothelioma, and particularly people with BAP1 mutations. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, so as we've um, heard about, um, this is sort of the uh, initial paper with Dr. Testa and Dr. Carboni showing that germline or hereditary mutations in BAP1 predisposes individuals to mesothelioma. And here's one of the, um, the graphics that you've seen previously of two families with hereditary mesothelioma. And as you can see, the people in the orange and yellow are people who carry BAP1 mutations. Now when we look at these families, the other things that we see are that uh, many of them have uveal melanomas, and that's really um, been elucidated by the work of Dr. Harbour, who you just heard from, and the importance of BAP1 in uveal melanomas. Well, for me as a dermatologist, where this gets really interesting is that there were then reports of families who had BAP1 mutations who developed these sort of unusual uh, Pig, or unusual skin lesions. So um, some of these ranged from uh, they from melanoma down to what looked like very benign lesions, these little pink bumps that actually look fairly atypical under the microscope. Well, it turns out that some of the people who have these moles also have uh, uveal and cutaneous as well as cutaneous melanoma. Um, and one group, the first group that reported on this said, it turns out this is associated with a hereditary or germline BAP1 mutation. So you saw this uh, picture before. So as you can see, these are not really uh, unusual looking lesions. Um, but to anybody in the room who's looked at pathology, we know that uh, these types of cells that have very big irregular nuclei are usually ones that are more concerning uh, for malignancy. So when we look at the families that uh, these lesions came from, we can see that there are many members of these families who had um, not only these unusual usual skin lesions, but also some with cutaneous melanoma. We also see people who had uveal melanoma. Now, as initially mentioned, um, these families, did, this initial um, group that was reported did not have mesothelioma until after this paper was published when this patient was actually diagnosed with peritoneal mesothelioma. So now we have this connection of mesothelioma, uveal melanoma, cutaneous or skin melanoma, 
and these unusual tumors, and we're starting to really see a, a syndrome unfold. Um, so this is where we got involved. We looked at these uh, two cohorts that you've heard about, the Wisconsin and Louisiana families, and we knew that these families had um, certainly a history of mesothelioma, but we also knew that one of these families had a history of uveal melanoma, and we knew that both carried BAP1 mutations. So we wanted to see, was this a unique finding from this group over in Germany, or did we actually have a, a syndrome that we could identify in patients that we knew in the United States had BAP1? So we went over and um, we, uh, I, I examined these people, we looked for these tumors, and these are the kind of things that I found. And I have to say, when I first saw them, I wasn't all that impressed. I thought I see things like this on patients every day, but let's take them off and let's take a look. So when we look at these under the microscope, what you'll see is that these lesions are very similar to the ones that were reported in previous papers. And when we look at these uh, at BAP1 staining on these uh, patients, we can see that up here, and up here, we see BAP1, that's that brown stain that's in the center of the cell or the nucleus, that these are positive. And those are normal, uh, normal nevi or moles that, are, um, that were found on these patients. Now, in association with these were these more atypical proliferations with bigger cells, as you can see here. And these ones actually have lost their BAP1 expression. So showing that BAP1 seems to really be playing an important role in the development of these uh, tumors. When we go back and we look at these patients or these families that have a history of BAP1 mutation and a reported history of melanoma, it turns out that their melanomas aren't the ones that, as a dermatologist, I see most uh, mostly, um, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. But they're an unusual variant um, that are called an epithelioid melanoma. And so, you, I think you guys remember hearing that term, epithelioid, which are these rounder cells, which explains some of the uveal melanoma type cells. Um, this is from Dr. Harbor's work, and you can see that if you have um, cells that are that don't have the BAP1 expression knocked out, that they're sort of stellate or angular in appearance. And then when you, um, you knock down the expression of BAP1, what you see is that these cells round up. So there really does seem to be an association with this um, epithelioid appearance. We see it in uveal melanomas, and it seems to be what we're seeing in the moles on these patients as well. Um, now, if you guys go back and read about this, a few groups have now uh, published on this, and you're going to see many different names. So just to clarify some of this, we're actually really all talking about the same thing. Um, so we call our tumors M-baits, and these are melanocytic BAP1-associated intraepidermal tumors. And I'll talk to you for a second in a minute why we picked that name. Um, the original uh, people who described these called them ASTs, or atypical spitzoid tumors. And the reason that we decided not to go with this is that as a dermatologist, the term atypical spitz tumor is something that is uh, a lesion that can metastasize or behave uh, funny. Spitz tumors are normally found in kids. When they're found in adults, they're sort of a bad deal. Um, they can look, uh, they can have very variable appearance. And I can tell you that a lot of dermatologists will see one of these and they want to go in and excise it and treat it more aggressively. And um, really, in examining the patients that I examined and talking to them about their lesions, these were not lesions that were behaving aggressively. These were not lesions that were growing rapidly. And so we wanted to sort of avoid causing a lot of hysteria about these lesions. Um, the other term that's been used are NE, uh, NEMPS, nevoid melanoma-like pro melanocytic proliferations. Again, the word melanoma in there. Um, I think would, would get a lot of people concerned about the risk of these particular spots. These are examples of these lesions that we've seen. Um, all of these are benign. Okay, so um, why don't we make it easy? Basically, it's because we don't want to get people panicked. We don't want the term atypical spitz tumor and have people get things like lymph node biopsies, wide surgical um, excisions. And the vast majority of these really behave in a benign way. Um, and when we compare things that we look at for spitz tumors versus atypical spitz versus these M-baits, as we like to call them, um, we can see some differences. Um, so uh, specifically, 
These tumors, the embates, are epithelioid in shape. Um, spits and atypical spits also have some, some epithelioid cells, but they also tend to have a, a um, noticeable spindle cell or those kind of more long cells uh, component to them. Um, the ones that we see, the m -baits, are really deeper in the skin, in the dermis. Most spits and atypical spits tumors are up higher in the skin in the epidermis as well as the dermis. Um, in terms of mitoses or division of cells, um, they're, they're one way to measure this is there's a stain called KI 67, we found that these tumors had lower levels of KI-67, suggesting that they're not rapidly growing and dividing. Uh, we also found that most of ours were uh, in association with a normal run-of-the-mill uh, nevus or mole on the patient, and that's not the case for some of the others. Um, so there are some other things that we do see that I'll talk about in a little bit that may suggest that um, some of these lesions could progress to more aggressive ones, um, but you know most of what we saw in the histories we got were that these were benignly behaving. So what's the difference between these things and a melanoma? Here are these embates, and these are pictures of melanoma. So we're really kind of talking about two different types of tumor, um, certainly these things are bad, these are the, these are the things that um, need to be treated um, rapidly and identified, but these are very different in appearance. Now, can these things ever turn into melanoma? We have some anecdotal evidence in the fact that some of these patients do have a history of melanoma when you look at their family trees or their pedigrees. Um, but here's an example of one uh, melanoma that was removed from a patient who carried a BAP1 mutation. And what you can see is at the base here, this is one of these um, epithelioid lesions. The, the nuclei don't look you know, too awful in here. Um, they're, they're smaller. However, above it is this big um, expansive proliferation that isn't one of these embates, but is actually a melanoma. We could see uh, really atypical dividing cells like that. So this would suggest that perhaps in this melanoma evolved from it, um, but not that you know fr from this little more benign lesion. The other thing that we found is that we did look for this gene BRAF, the a mutation in BRAF. And uh, BRAF mutations are found in some melanomas. They're also found in some Spitz nevi. However, um, it does suggest that perhaps, um, as, as a previous speaker mentioned, that um, when you have one gene and then you start to accumulate several other genetic mutations, there may be a risk of some of these uh, progressing to, uh, to melanoma. Um, so one group did actually look at sporadic melanomas, not ones that were from mesothelioma patients, and they found that 5% um, of melanomas will carry the somatic, so the, the acquired later BAP1 mutation. So we think that BAP1 can play some role in melanoma, um, but it's, it's probably not something that is a major player in cutaneous or skin melanoma the way that it is in the uveal or the eye melanoma. Another way of looking at this is that one group um, that follows patients with hereditary cutaneous or skin melanoma, they took a sample of 200 families or individuals from families with hereditary melanoma, and they divided that into um, what, which, which people have both skin and eye or uveal and cutaneous melanoma, and they found that there's seven families that had a history of both, and then they found that 193 uh, families had a history of skin-only melanoma. So it turns out that of those seven families with skin and eye melanoma, two families had germline BAP1 mutations, or 28% of those, so a fairly high rate if you see both of those in one family. However, if you look at the people who don't have a history of ocular melanoma and only have skin melanoma, they only had one family or less than 1% that carried that. So that suggests that the hereditary mutation of BAP1 is more strongly associated with the family skin plus eye melanoma not in, rather than with the hereditary skin alone. Um, when we looked at, um, in our paper where we looked at the families in the United States that had these BAP1 mutations, um, and then also looked um, at, at the other reported families with BAP1 mutations, if you do some analysis, you can see that having, um, there's, there's a, about a 17-fold increase in risk of having um, at least one cancer if you carry a BAP1 mutation. So this really goes along with the idea of this BAP1 cancer uh, syndrome. Certainly, if you look at mesothelioma, 
of the only cases of, of mesothelioma were among patients with the BAP1 mutation, as well as uveal melanoma. Um, interestingly, we also see that with um, if, you, if we try to get histories of cutaneous or skin melanoma, um, and that does us seem to be statistically significant. And as well, the MBATES, or these uh, tumors, really were only seen in people who had known BAP1 mutations. Uh, for other cancers that have been suggested, we didn't see it, but again, this is, you need large numbers to see less common uh, tumors. So really, we're looking at, is this a, a BAP1 cancer uh, syndrome? And we do know that certainly uveal melanoma, certainly mesothelioma, and it would see, seem cutaneous melanoma um, are, um, are things that we may be at risk at if, in people who have BAP1 mutations, as well as these MBATES, or these tumors. Um, other tumors that may be associated include breast, renal or kidney uh, tumors, lung cancer, other ones including uh, bone marrow or blood-borne tumors. One group uh, actually coined a term for this, the common syndrome, which is cutaneous and ocular melanoma, characteristic melanocytic proliferations, and other internal neoplasms. Um, so what, as a dermatologist, or what can we take away from this? So what we found when we study these MBATES is that they tend to develop during the second uh, decade of life, so earlier than people would be diagnosed with other cancers in general, like uveal melanoma or like mesothelioma. And I think that the role as dermatologists, what role can we play? We can help to identify these people. Um, so it's not that everybody who has a pink bump, we say, boy, you may be getting mesothelioma, or or uveal melanoma, but it's that um, when we do get these things that look pretty benign um, clinically, but then we biopsy them and we get back this you know, report of an atypical Spitz tumor or an epithelioid tumor, we probably need to go digging a little deeper. We need to ask, do these, uh, anyone in your family have a uveal melanoma? Has anyone in your family had a mesothelioma? And we can maybe help to identify people who may be at risk for these tumors early because this is such an early uh, marker. And so as we know, there are things that we can do to uh, maybe help lower the risk of some other tumors, whether it's strict avoidance of um, asbestos. Certainly we could counsel people in terms of what kind of career they may choose or what kind of housing they may choose to live in. And as a dermatologist, you know, we're always looking for ways to encourage people to use good sun protection as well. So, you know, mesothelioma is bad enough. You know, do I have to worry about melanoma too. Um, so for most people with mesothelioma, it, you're really, the risk is not going to be higher than in the general population. For people who have BAP1 mutations, there may be uh, a, a slightly higher risk. And so the things that you can do are protect your skin and eyes from the sun. And I can't say that's only for people with BAP1 mutation. I mean, that's for everybody. Um, sun protection is key to preventing melanoma. Most melanomas are not going to occur in people who are genetically at risk. They're going to occur in the general population. But certainly if you know that you have a higher risk, remember sunblock, remember um, you know, wearing uh, protective clothing, and remember wearing things like you know, sunglasses. Okay, so I have this pink bump on my skin, so that's really bad, right? No. These are lots of pink bumps that I see every day on patients. If I looked at everybody, I'd find a pink bump of some sort. Every pink bump is not an indicator um, of of melanoma or of a, a risk of melanoma or mesothelioma. All of these are, are, um, are harmless and common. So if you do carry a BAP1 mutation, it's probably reasonable to see a dermatologist starting at the age of 18 um, annually um, for screening. And you know, I, I, in terms of ophthalmology, I don't know what kind of screening they do, but certainly talking to your ophthalmologist about the risk. Um, so most of these lesions are not going to these embates or whatever you want to call them are not going to uh, progress to melanoma. Um, I, we would never recommend go out and get every single pink bump on your skin, you know, removed and excised at this point. Um, it's just like most of us have moles, little brown nevi or moles on our skin. Nobody would ever recommend that you remove all of them, even though maybe about half of all melanomas start in nevi. It doesn't mean that most of them are going in that direction or going to, to, to um, 
to progress to melanoma, we look at it as a marker of the more moles you have in general, the higher your melanoma risk. If you have M. Bates, it's a marker that perhaps we need to follow you more carefully or look for a germline BAP1 mutation. Um, if you're going to have a dermatologist follow you, make sure that they understand what this gene is and what this does. I can tell you, when I presented all this work to my colleagues and my residents, um, none of them had ever heard of BAP1. So most dermatologists aren't going to know about it, you may need to be the one that says, hey, what about this gene, um, you know, BAP1, and if you find something, um, I want you to know that I have this. The other thing is to make sure that whoever, if you do get a skin biopsy, the pathologist who's reading it is aware of this as well. So um, one, you'd want a specialized skin pathologist, and um, two, you'd want to make sure that they've heard of these. So um, you don't want them to read this as an atypical spitz uh, tumor and have the, the pathologist who may not understand the syndrome and the dermatologist who may not going in and recommending really aggressive of care, really aggressive care. So that's it. Thank you very much. The next speaker is uh, Jill O'Hara. Uh, Dr. O'Hara is a professor of medicine in the section of uh, pulmonary critical care allergy and immunologic disease at Wake Forest University in uh, North Carolina. It's a pleasure to have uh, Jill speak to us. Well, thanks a lot. Um, I'm very honored to have a chance to speak to you today. Uh, this is a, an update of research in progress. Um, I guess I should kind of start out, though, that I've, to say that I've learned a lot already this morning, and uh, this has been a great symposium. Uh, mostly I learned from Dr. Harbour about stem cells. I really never thought of them this way. Um, and that is, is that they kind of reminded me of my ex-husband. They tended to revert back. They were uncontrolled and exhibited dangerous behavior. So, you know, okay. <laughs> so, you've seen a lot of these slides before. We're all, have you noticed we're all uh, using the same slides? Um, but that will allow me to go a, a little more quickly because of time constraints. Um, it's already been mentioned that, that somewhere around 30 million Americans between uh, 1940 and 1980 were significantly exposed to asbestos in their workplace. Uh, this does not in any way, this, this large number in any way reflect all of those bystander exposures, the wives who washed the clothes, the kids who crawled up on daddy's knee uh, after he came home from work uh, with his dirty overalls on. Um, despite that very vast number, there are only about 3,000 new cases of mesothelioma diagnosed annually. It's estimated there's probably an equal number who die and are never diagnosed but still 6,000 a year versus 27 or 30 million uh, is a startling gap. Um, this is my attempt to kind of make some sense, some rationality of that. We've heard a lot about genetics today. Um, certainly, we've also heard a little bit about inflammation and immunology. Um, it seems that age at first exposure may be important. We published a paper that showed that the younger you were when you were first exposed, the better the chance that you might get mesothelioma. There's a precedent in that um, in both lung cancer and uh, COPD with the earlier you start smoking cigarettes, the better the chance you'll get those, even when you factor in the total number of cigarettes that you've smoked. Uh, gender, um, are women more uh, prone to mesothelioma? There are some um, older papers that would seem to imply that, and clearly the longer the latency, uh, the better the chance you'll uh, show up with a mesothelioma. And then finally, dose. And you can see there are people who have huge doses that have a pretty good chance of getting mesothelioma and very little in the way of a genetic uh, a genetic predisposition, 
Equally, there may be people down here who have a huge genetic predisposition and maybe little or no asbestos exposure whatsoever. This is just a hypothesis. Now, I'm going to update you on what we're doing to, to try to look at this. We believe that there probably is a genetic predisposition, and so several years ago, I started collecting uh, blood to isolate DNA on people who had mesotheliomas uh, with the idea that we would do a genome-wide scan. Um, since that time, we've become enamored with the BAP1 story, and so I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing with that. But to date, uh, you can see, whoops, you can see that we have uh, 441 samples. We started a consortium uh, to share the DNA, um, and that was funded by MARF, and you can see the centers that have contributed uh, to that thus far, and we are still accepting samples. We also noted in our large cohort that there was this very strong cancer signal. Uh, when we looked at the first degree relatives of people who had mesothelioma, we saw that overall there was about a threefold greater chance that they would have a first degree relative um, that, that had a cancer. And if we looked at their kids, and remember that cancers, just generic cancer, colon, breast, prostate, lymphoma, those kinds of things, these are usually age-dependent tumors. That means the older you are, the better the chance that you're going to come up with a cancer. And when we looked at these mesothelioma victims' children, they had about a seven-fold greater chance of, of having a, a kid with cancer compared to our asbestos-exposed controls. Now, there have been a lot of tumors that you've heard about today that may have a link uh, to BAP1 germline mutations. So what we did is we looked at our population, so overall 441 mesotheliomas, and we wanted to look at just those who had a very strong personal and family history of cancer. Furthermore, we have a control group of approximately 3,500 asbestos-exposed individuals who have asbestos-related disease in the form of pleural plaques or some fibrosis but do not have a cancer uh, or do not have an asbestos-related cancer. And we looked in that group of 3,500 to look for people who had no personal history of cancer no family history of cancer, and who had the longest latency, that means the time from they were first exposed to asbestos until we evaluated them, so we could give them plenty of time to develop a mesothelioma if they were going to. We then created a cancer epidemiology scoring system. And so if you had one condition, like a, like a personal history of having had a cancer before you got your mesothelioma, you got a point. If you had a parent that had a cancer, you got a point. If you had a sibling, a brother or sister who had a cancer, you got a point. If you had a child with a cancer, you got a point. Furthermore, we thought we'd seen in our families that sometimes there were a large number of brothers and sisters who had cancer, so we gave you an extra point if more than half of your brothers and sisters had a cancer. We also gave you an extra point if you had a kid with cancer, because as we mentioned, this age relationship with the development uh, of, of uh, cancers overall. And finally, you got an extra point if you had a personal history or a family history of having a cancer that was, that was potentially related to BAP1. So, these are the centers then that contributed to the BAP1 cohort. In all, there was 151. Um, and we also came up with 154 controls. And um, as I mentioned, uh, we wanted to, to look for people who had a very long latency in our controls. Um, and you'll note that 
many of the people that we have in our cohort are workers and therefore blue collar workers and, and um, today and even in the old days, uh, if you wanted to find smokers, you didn't look at doctors and lawyers and Indian chiefs, but blue collar workers even today tend to smoke more frequently uh, than do librarians who have the lowest prevalence of cigarette smoking in the United States. Are, we, are there any librarians here? Good, let's give that person a hand. <laughs> All right. Um, but as you can see, the latency um, was longest for the control group. Um, age at first exposure, um, our, our mesos tend to, to be um, very young at their first exposure, often in high school jobs, uh, jobs after school in high school and uh, in college. Um, our cohort uh, is unusual because it's workers, so it has mostly men in it. Um, when we looked at um, the history of cancer, you'll note there's no control group here because all of this would be zeros for them. We picked them, hand-picked them, that they had no personal history of cancer in the past, no parents with cancer, no siblings with cancer, no children with cancer. And you can see that overall, our mesos tend to have that high prevalence, but this group that we used in the BAP1, or that we're using in the BAP1 project, have a particular, particularly high rate of, uh, of cancers, and that's by design. Um, you've seen this already, you've seen this slide. It's a picture of the, the uh, BAP1 gene. Um, we're sequencing this gene in all 305 uh, of the patients um, that, uh, that we've picked out, the 151 uh, or mesotheliomas and the 154 controls. To date, we've uh, sequenced just 28 samples. Um, the samples were given to the two centers, Fox Chase and our center, in a very random fashion by design. So you'll see that the, the randomization um, has ended up that only five cases have been um, sequenced to date and 23 controls. Um, this is, of course, continuing even as we speak. Um, as you can see, these are the known mutations um, that have already been presented for the uveal melanomas. Um, next is what we have so far. These are the mutations uh, that we have seen. Um, and the red ones are our, um, our cases and the blue are our controls. No, I take that back. Our blue are our cases, our red are our controls. Um, and what we can see at this point is that um, while there are several SNPs that we see, most of them are, are in non-coding sections. Now there um, are a few here at the splice site, um, or near the, one near the splice site that may in the end be important, but we have no knowledge of that yet. Um, there also are uh, a few down at the untranslated region, the three prime region, um, that may also have functional rel relevance, but we don't know that yet. So um, this is not to enlighten you, but just to tell you what's ongoing at our center. Um, we'd like to thank all of you who have been involved so far, who've given us blood. Uh, we would like more, obviously. Um, and so if you uh, are interested, if you have a mesothelioma and you're interested in giving blood, please contact Mary. She knows how to get a hold of me and uh, we can uh, enroll you into the study. These are the numerous folks who have uh, contributed um, to this study so far and the ongoing work. So thank you for this opportunity to speak to you. Our last speaker is uh, Dr. Carboni, and I've already introduced him. He's still the Cancer Center Director as, as of about an hour ago. We just lost our Cancer Center Director instantly. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be back at MARF after many years. Uh, several of you asked me yesterday night how is that it was many years that I was not here. I have no idea. The time passed very fast. 
But in fact, it has been several years. Uh, uh, last time that I came here, I think I thought about uh, what at that time some people thought was a crazy idea that there was a gene that caused mesothelioma in certain family. In fact, I remember that there was a lawyer who listened to me at my talk, and he published an article that said that, uh, um, he said that Dr. Carbone, rather than wasting his time going uh, uh, to Cappadocia and to rural areas in America, could, should go to the Caribbean and enjoy life. I, uh, because there is not such a thing as a gene. Uh, <coughs> the newspaper uh, guy, the, the guy who wrote the article, called me, wanted me to comment. I declined that. So we did a lot of progress since that time. You hear a lot about this gene today. Um, I am not going to give you a, a formal presentation. I had the pleasure, of, the pleasure, the fortune, the whatever you want to call it, over the years to work with, uh, for more than 10 years now, with Dr. Testa, with Dr. Pass, with Dr. Young, <coughs> sorry, and more uh, recently with Dr. Ferris, and I work uh, as a team with them, and uh, I would uh, inevitably repeat many of the things that you heard, and I think that you heard enough today. So uh, I'm not going to give you a formal presentation. I'll just make a couple of comments. What does all this mean? What is this BAP1? Well, obviously it means a lot to people who carry the BAP1 mutation, but most patients with mesothelioma do not carry a germline mutation. Still about at least a third, but probably more than that, probably half of them carry BAP1 mutations in their tumor. So what that tells us is that uh, this BAP1 gene is very important in the process that causes mesothelioma. And so now we are studying how this process goes, what happens, what are we really do not know how this BAP1 works. We have a lot of hypotheses out there, but we do not know how it works. So we are studying <coughs> how we can by un understand how BAP1 works to develop specific therapies for mesothelioma because you know that we do not have specific therapies for mesothelioma. At the same time, we discovered that it was not just mesothelioma, but there is melanoma. Who would have thought that melanoma and mesothelioma had something in common? Nothing. And so people who are uh, experts in the field of melanoma are coming into the mesothelioma field, but also we can learn from what has been uh, uh, done in the field of uh, melanoma and see if we can apply something from the melanoma fields to the mesothelioma and vice versa, since now we find that the pathways that give rise to these tumors are the same. Um, you heard a lot about uh, how these genes work in the previous presentation. I have a paper that is out this week uh, together uh, with uh, some of the people that I mentioned before, with Dr. Testa, with Dr. Pass, with Dr. Young, in uh, Nature Review Cancer. The paper is out this week. I will give a copy, I forgot in my room, to Mari uh, so that this afternoon will be out there. If you want to know more about this BAP1, everything uh, that is basic science will be there. And uh, uh, for what is uh, the clinical part, I already gave the 50 copies that I had of the paper that we published in Journal of Translational Medicine with Laura Ferris uh, that she showed the slides before. And uh, uh, there we discuss all the clinical aspects of this cancer syndrome. So if you want to know about the clinical trials and all this part, um, you can take a look at this paper. The other part that we have learned is that genetics by itself uh, uh, is one factor, but inflammation is a critical factor. And in fact, inflammation is what drives the, prog the process of carcinogenesis and possibly the growth of these tumor cells. You heard the, the work of Heining Young and how in fact by targeting inflammation, we may be able to delay tumor growth. And you know, if you can delay tumor growth in a tumor that appears in the 70s and 80s, well, if you can make it appear in the 90s and in the 100s, you've done a lot. So we want to see whether we can delay tumor growth uh, or whether we can use uh, the, this, some of these inflammatory markers uh, for uh, early detection of this tumor when, as you heard from Dr. Pass, the tumor is much more susceptible to therapy. The other part that I wanted to tell you is that uh, this uh, work has been possible because of teamwork. Now, teamwork in science is a difficult thing to do. And the reason is not just that scientists are naturally egoistic and uh, full of themselves uh, and want to compete with each other. I mean, there is certainly some truth into it. But uh, the main reason is that the system is set up in such a way that does not favor people to work together, even if in principle it does, because we go ahead in our careers by um, publishing papers, by getting grants. The, our institution want the grants to come to our institutions and therefore we are naturally competing with each other. 
Instead, what we have done in the mesothelioma field is uh, to create a network of some of the top researchers in the country and internationally who have worked together, who have shared what we had and different expertise. And that's how, for example, this BAP1 gene was found, and that's how all this uh, research has been found. And uh, uh, as this uh, team enlarged, the other people come to the field and bring their expertise to it. You hear today, we, we have here today Dr. Ferris. Uh, uh, the reason that Dr. Ferris is here is that she's one of the top experts in melanoma, and so when I needed uh, somebody who was an expert in melanoma, I called Laura. Now, Laura is a Pittsburgh, a am in Honolulu. Still, it doesn't make a difference, because nowadays, thanks to Federal Express, email, I mean, airplanes, in fact, with Laura, we did two trips in Wisconsin and in Louisiana, uh, to collect uh, samples from these families that we are studying. In fact, one of the families I met here, uh, the Louisiana family was thanks to the Mar Foundation that uh, I met them here, and that's how we were able then to follow them. Um, MARF has been instrumental in uh, supporting this collaboration. Um, Marius Dorfer in particular has been, I do not know where he's married now, but Mary uh, has played a critical role, in fact, in the collection of samples that allowed us to uh, identify the BAP1 gene. Without her, we probably would have done it, but later. Uh, and so she played a critical role. And she continues to play a critical role in uh, uh, enrolling families uh, because we need the largest possible number of families in order to come down with some minimal results. If we have few families, we do not know what exactly something means, as you heard from Dr. Haber. But the more we have together, the easier it is to study. So Mary is, in fact, continuing to play this role in helping us enlarge the number of families that we are studying. So if you know of anybody who suspects to have a, a familiar condition, please have them contact Mary, because the larger the pedigrees that we have, the more quicker we can do progress going forward. <coughs> So we have really done faster and better in mesothelioma because of teamwork. The MARF Foundation has allowed us to have a forum that provided uh, to expand this network of collaborations. And in fact, together with them, now we have submitted to the NCI one of the largest grants that, uh, application that uh, the NCI funds that is called SPORE. There has never been a SPORE funded for mesothelioma. It looks that uh, um, our application was received well. I do not know whether it's going to get funded this year or not, but uh, it would be a fantastic thing if we can bring a spore, because it would mean a tremendous amount of uh, resources to the mesothelioma field. And spores grants are grants that are designed, in fact, for teamwork and to get people from different uh, um, angles to study the same disease. So I'm very grateful to Marfa. I am very happy to be here again. And I'm very happy to be here now that the gene, in fact, has been found and that uh, half of the talks today, are actually three quarters of them, were about this gene, which uh, having been here a few years ago just talking about the hypothesis after which I was after, I have to say it was a great satisfaction to see that, that in fact that has become true. Uh, thank you very much. Well, I think this was a terrific session, and I hope you all feel the same way. Um, I will leave you, I, I understand everyone wants to get to have some lunch, and that's, uh, so I'll make my remarks in about two minutes. Um, despite what we know now, there are already some issues that are arising that are uh, extremely interesting and somewhat alarming. Um, for example, I have one family that contacted me that do not want to be tested after initially thinking they should be tested because they're afraid that their children will not be able to get insurance. I'm, I'm told by uh, many of the people in our family risk assessment program that that is not the case. So I think we will have to get that message out to folks um, because uh, knowledge is strength for all of you. Secondly, I think from a biological point of view, there are some very interesting questions. Why does a BAP1 mutation occur in the germline and predispose somebody to getting cancer? And yet Dr. Harbour has elegantly shown it can also be a mutation that leads to metastasis. How does a gene do both of those things? 
Uh, we had two squamous cell carcinomas in Louisiana family. Are those cases really squamous cell carcinoma or are they some other kind of uh, skin lesion that we weren't aware of before? Not all of those individuals did we have access uh, to uh, them with a dermatologist at that time. Secondly, a uh, thirdly rather, uveal melanoma is in all of the textbooks that I've uh, tried to search this out on listed as not having um, an effect of ultraviolet light, sunlight on this disease. Is it possible that if you have a germline mutation that that makes you exquisitely sensitive to getting uveal melanoma? Remember those studies that are done that say there's no connection are done in the general population, 99.9% .9 of whom will have no germline mutation. So that's another question I think we need to address. Uh, along the same lines, is asbestos really going to be essential? I've already been contacted by several lawyers. I don't know if there are any here, but it, sometimes it's very disturbing because I get the sense that some of the lawyers are calling simply to try to uh, get their clients off from uh, paying what they really owe the patients, which is a settlement uh, for asbestos exposure. To my knowledge, there is no evidence. We're going to do this in mouse studies. I'm sure other groups will do it as well to see if mice with BAP1 mutations are more sensitive, uh, more likely, more vulnerable to get mesothelioma than a wild-type mouse. Uh, but the reality is we have really no evidence that a person who gets mesothelioma with VAP1 mutation gets it just because of the mutation. Uh, I think everyone, probably even in this room, there's asbestos. Nobody walks the walk without being exposed to asbestos. Even one paper reported by Weissner, I hope he's not here, but I, will, I know he told me personally that a family he reported uh, that had no exposure to asbestos, he told me that that family had lived in an apartment building where they removed the roof. The roofs in Europe uh, often have asbestos um, in them. In removing that asbestos, there's no reason to suspect you couldn't get some of that to come into the air conditioning system and expose people. And there is no threshold for safety. You don't say, okay, I'm, all, I'm okay as long as I don't get this much asbestos. We don't know that there's a safe level of any asbestos. Um, the other thing I think is why do some people get mesothelioma and others get uveal melanoma, others get cutaneous melanoma? One of the pedigrees that was placed up here uh, showed not one person in that family getting uh, mesothelioma. Why is that? Um, and what, what causes, and we don't even know this for P53, what causes a gamut or spectrum of diseases to be um, caused, uh, to have a particular mutation? For example, in Lee-Fermini syndrome, why these particular tumors, some of which, like adrenal cancers that are kind of uncommon, why are they getting um, uh, the mutation causing that uh, type of cancer? Uh, it's quite possible that there may be things at the expression level uh, of different cell types that might make them common at the epigenetic level that we can't uh, imagine uh, based on their um, histology. Um, and finally, I think uh, Dr. Ferris uh, gave a, a very good lesson for us. We want to be learned. We want to get information. Knowledge is great. Um, we don't want to become crazy about this. Um, I mean, I think that if a person does have a lesion, get to a uh, a very experienced dermatologist, uh, but there's no sense uh, getting crazy about the fact that you have some little pimple on your, on your skin. Um, and finally, um, I think um, for all the families um, who are here, um, like Dr. Carboni, I want to express my deepest appreciation for the support uh, that the MARF has given. Uh, in fact, uh, one of my colleagues at Fox Chase recently received uh, an award to do that very kind of study to look at two different mouse models where we've made mutations that are exactly like the mutations in Louisiana family and in the Wisconsin family to see if they do have susceptibility to mesothelioma spontaneously or if you give them asbestos, asbestos do they get a a higher rate of uh, mesotheliomas than their wild-type 
uh, litter mates. So I want to end with that and, and thank you all very much. And any of the cards uh, that are um, where you have any additional questions, I think there are plenty of opportunities, Mary's indicated, during this meeting we'll be able to address those questions uh, in another forum. So I thank you all very much for joining us today.